Hello everyone and welcome to this week's OpenGL water tutorial and this week we're going to be rendering to frame buffer objects. So usually when we render our scene we see the result on the screen but we can also render our scene and store the result in a texture instead of putting the result onto the screen. Once we've rendered the scene to a texture we can then use that texture just like any other texture and we can render it onto 3D objects, 2D GUIs or whatever you want. So that's what you're seeing on the screen now. What I've done here is to first render the scene to a texture, and then I've rendered the scene as normal to the screen, but I've now used that texture that I created to texture this GUI in the top left corner here. And because I render to that texture every single frame, the GUI texture is constantly being updated. So what has all this got to do with rendering water? Well, if you have a look at this water here, you can see the reflection of the scene on the surface of the water. And the way that I've done that is exactly the same thing that I did with the GUI here. I first rendered the scene to a texture, and then I rendered the scene to the screen as normal, but I then used that texture that I rendered to earlier to texture the water's surface. And if you choose the correct camera position when you do that first render pass, then you can create an accurate reflection of the scene. So that's what we're going to be doing this week, and to render to the textures, we're going to need to use something called frame buffer objects. When we render our scene, we render our objects and terrains one by one, but they don't appear onto the screen until we update the display. When we render an object, it first gets rendered to the frame buffer. The frame buffer stores all of the data about what's going to be rendered onto the display. It has a color buffer, which is basically a 2D array of pixel colors, and it's this that gets shown on the screen when we update the display. As we render each object, the scene gets created on the color buffer. There's also another buffer called the depth buffer, which stores the depth information of each pixel that's in the color buffer. When you render an object with depth testing enabled, the object will first be checked against the depth information in the depth buffer. This tests whether the object you're rendering should be in front or behind the other objects that you've already rendered, and it then discards any pixels that are hidden. So if you render an object that is completely hidden by another object, then the depth test will notice that and the color buffer won't be updated at all, hence you don't see the object on the screen. There are also some other buffers like the stencil buffer, but we don't need to worry about them just yet. Once you've finished rendering the scene to the frame buffer, you update the display and the image in the color buffer is put onto the screen. You can then clear all of the buffers and render the scene all over again for the next frame. However, we don't just have to render to this one frame buffer, we can also create our own frame buffer objects. Once we've created a frame buffer object, we can give them attachments such as a color buffer and a depth buffer, and then we can render objects to this frame buffer instead of the default frame buffer. So before we render anything, we now have a choice where we want the object to be rendered to. We can still render to the default frame buffer, which would eventually be displayed on our screen, or we could render to one of our own behind the scenes frame buffers. So let's say we choose to render to our frame buffer object here, and let's render a dragon and a couple of trees. The depth buffer and the color buffer of this frame buffer get updated accordingly, but the default frame buffer is still completely empty. We could then switch back to the default frame buffer, render a car and some houses for example, update the display, and then only the default frame buffer's color buffer is shown on the screen. These other frame buffer objects are off-screen buffers, and their contents don't affect what's shown on the screen when we update the display. So this frame buffer object seems a bit pointless right now, but one nice thing that we can do is that we can use textures as attachments here. So instead of this color buffer just being a load of data in memory somewhere, it's now an actual 2D texture, just like any of the other textures that we use in our game. This means that when we render to this frame buffer object and the color buffer gets updated, we're actually updating this 2D texture. So we could render a lion to this frame buffer, which would update the texture here, and then we could switch back to the default frame buffer, render a picture frame or something, and then we could use this texture here to texture the picture frame, just like we texture any other object in our world. So we can create a texture using frame buffer objects and then use it in our world, which is exactly what I've done here, except I'm not rendering a lion to that first frame buffer object, I'm rendering the whole scene. And it's not only the color buffer attachment that can be a texture, any of these attachments could be a texture, so the depth buffer here could also be a texture if we want, um, and then that would allow us to sample it in the fragment shader at some point if we wanted to, which we most definitely will in future tutorials. So for the purpose of rendering water, we're going to be creating two frame buffer objects, both with depth buffers and color buffer attachments. 
In one of these, we'll render the reflection texture, as I mentioned earlier, and in the other one, we're going to render the refraction texture, and we're going to be using these textures in future tutorials. Both of the color buffer attachments here are going to be textures, of course, so that we can use them to texture the water's surface, but the depth buffer of the refraction texture is also going to be a texture, because this will basically be storing the depth of the water, and we'll want to sample that in the fragment shader in the future when we're rendering the water, so that we can do some nice depth effects. So in this tutorial, I think it would just be easier if I give you the code for the frame buffer object, and then take you through it, instead of trying to program and explain it at the same time. So you can download the code for this class in the description of this video, and then just put this class into your water package. So I'll just quickly explain all of the OpenGL related code here so that you can understand what's going on. So we'll start down here with the code that we use to create a frame buffer object. So just like when we create any other OpenGL object, we first call a glgen method, and this is glgen frame buffers, which gets a new frame buffer ready for us, and it returns the ID of that frame buffer. Then, just like with VAOs, VBOs, and textures, if we want to do anything with the frame buffer, we have to bind it. So we call GL bind frame buffer. It's a frame buffer that we're binding, and then we give it the ID of the frame buffer that we want to bind. Then this line here just tells OpenGL which color buffer attachment in the currently bound FBO we would want to render to, uh, because you can actually add multiple color buffer attachments to an FBO, and then you would have to select which one you're rendering to but we're just going to be using one color buffer attachment, so we'll always be rendering to color attachment zero. So that's how we create a frame buffer, but then we have to add the necessary attachments to it. So this method here adds a color buffer texture attachment to the currently bound frame buffer object. So most of this code should be fairly familiar, as we've done this before when creating textures. The only new line is this one here, which adds the texture attachment to the currently bound frame buffer object and it sets it as color attachment zero, which as I just said, is the color attachment that we're always going to render to. The final parameter here determines which MIP map level of the texture we want to use, and seeing as we haven't generated any MIP maps here, we just want to put zero. Then down here we've got another method for adding a depth buffer texture attachment, which is pretty similar except we set the format of the texture to a 32-bit depth texture, and we put gl depth attachments as the second parameter in the gl frame buffer texture method. Then down here we've got a method to add a depth buffer attachment that isn't a texture, and these non-texture attachments are called render buffers. As you can see, it's pretty familiar stuff, a gl gen method to get the ID of the new render buffer, and then a gl bind method to bind the render buffer and allow us to use it. We then tell OpenGL what we're going to be storing in the render buffer, which is of course depth information, and then we attach it to the frame buffer as the depth attachment using the GL frame buffer render buffer method. So once we've created our own FBOs, we have the choice as to whether we want to render to the default frame buffer or to one of our own frame buffer objects. To tell OpenGL that we want to render to one of our own frame buffer objects, we have to bind the relevant frame buffer object, and then everything that we render after that will be rendered to that FBO. To bind a frame buffer object, we simply call the GL bind frame buffer method, and we put in the ID of the frame buffer that we want to bind, and then we change the resolution of our viewport to the resolution of our frame buffer objects, because we can actually choose the resolution of our FBOs when we create them. And I've got the resolutions up here, which you can change if you want, but the lower the resolution, the less expensive it is to render to. If we want to switch back to rendering to the default frame buffer, we simply have to call the GL bind frame buffer method and put in a zero as the ID. Anything we render after that will be rendered to the default frame buffer. The only other OpenGL method that we need to use are these here, which are fairly self-explanatory and are just used to delete all the frame buffers, texture attachments, and render buffer attachments when we close the game. The rest of this class is just simple Java code, so it should be easy for anyone to understand, and what it does is to create two FBOs, one with a color buffer and depth buffer texture attachment, and the other with a color buffer texture attachment and a depth buffer render buffer attachment. The textures can then be accessed using these getter methods, and the relevant FBO can be bound by calling one of these methods. So let's now test out this code for ourselves. So in the main game loop, when we load the game, we're going to want to create those two frame buffers. So we'll create a new water frame buffers object. And then before we forget, we're going to clean up those frame buffers when the game closes. 
So every frame we're going to want to render to one of those frame buffers and to do that we need to bind the frame buffer that we want to render to. So here I'm going to bind the reflection buffer, no particular reason why, and then we're going to render the scene to that buffer, but notice that this doesn't include the water or the GUIs. Then we'll switch back to the default frame buffer and we'll render the scene again, render the water and render the GUIs as normal, and then we'll update the display to put all of that onto the screen. So right now we're updating the reflection texture every frame, but we're not actually doing anything with it. So what I'm going to do now is to create a GUI which I'm going to render the reflection texture onto. So I'm going to do this before the while loop and I'm just going to paste this in. So what I've done here is to create a new GUI which uses the reflection texture and I've put it in the top left of the screen. I then add this GUI to my list of GUI textures so that it gets rendered when I render the GUIs. You don't have to render it to a GUI though, you can render the texture onto anything you want, but just make sure that you're not rendering it onto anything that gets rendered when you're rendering to that texture. You can't render the texture onto something that then gets rendered to the texture that you're rendering onto something that gets... It'll create a horrible paradox and your computer will explode, so just make sure that you don't do that. So now if I run the game it should all be working and you can see here that in the top left corner of the screen I'm rendering that GUI and on the GUI is a slightly lower resolution rendering of the scene. And it will be upside down because of the OpenGL texture coordinate system because for OpenGL the Y axis on the textures is inverted from what we would normally use but we'll talk more about that next time. So that is going to be it for this week. Next time we're going to be using clipping planes to only render the necessary parts of the scene to the FBOs. If you haven't seen yesterday's devlog video about the PvP updates in my game, then you can give that a watch. A link to that is on the screen now, and you can keep in touch with me via any of my social media pages. Links are in the description below. But yeah, thank you guys very much for watching this video. Do subscribe if you haven't already. Have a fantastic week, and I will see you all next time. So for the purpose of rendering water, we're going to be creating two frame buffer objects, both both with depth buffers, both with depth buffers and color buffer attached, both with depth buffer, depth buffer, both with depth buffer, depth both with both with depth buffer, both with depth both both with depth, both with So for the purpose of rendering water, we're going to be creating two frame buffer objects, both with depth both both with depth, both with depth, both with depth.